And we also just want to take a second and thank you all in this room, because it's only because you all chose to uh, register and show up in Austin, Minnesota for three days in June, right after school got out, uh, that we can even hold an event like this. Uh, in count, we had uh, eight different states represented by our uh, registered uh, participants, as well as uh, well, two countries. So again, thank you all for attending. Give yourselves a, a round of applause. Next, I need to uh, introduce a few people that are you know, sitting in the front row here. And uh, as the theme was created very early and often by Wendy, let's start with the bosses. Uh, apparently, uh, if you haven't already been made aware of this, Wendy's boss is apparently here this week. And I think she's reinforcing that. You know, it must be uh, June and year-end evaluation season or something. Clearly. <laughs> Um, she was not shy about letting us know that uh, Doug Paulson from the department is uh, here uh, and is Wendy's boss. In a similar theme, I'd like to introduce you to David Prenz, the superintendent of Austin Public Schools, who is my boss. In addition, uh, we have Kathy Green on the school board from Austin Public Schools, who is David's boss. Kathy, uh, a familiar face to you all, David Wolf, who was our uh, GT coordinator for a long time, uh, then uh, did some other stuff that we won't talk about, and now he's here <laughs> back in Austin Public Schools, and he is the newest uh, principal of Nevlin Elementary, and I am his boss. <laughs> Uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Craig Johnson from the Hornell Foundation, who is all of our bosses, really, because he's the reason why we're here and are able to pull off such an event. So I'll uh, hand it over to Craig. Thank you, John. I'm nobody's boss, actually. <clears throat> well, uh, welcome. It's great to all have you all out here on the prairie. The, uh, the uh, flat, uh, productive, somewhat boring plains that we live on. As I have traveled uh, around the country and uh, sometimes in Europe, and occasionally if I'm asked where I'm from and I say Minnesota, people say, oh, well, that's a really beautiful state. And I ask, well, what part of it, what picture do you have? Where I'm headed with this what picture do you have in your mind when you think of beautiful Minnesota? I mean, of course, it's the high end forest and the lakes, or it's uh, the North Shore of Lake Superior. Uh, sometimes the uh, Hiawatha Valley, from where it wrapping down to Winona, or Dave, I should say, La Crescent. Uh, but uh, I then tell them, well, that's true. They are very pretty places. That's not where I live. <laughs> if, you want a, if you want a picture of where I live, you picture Iowa. <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, we have a lot of uh, beautiful things out here on the prairie. I, I, at one time, I, we all understand it was beautiful. It was endless miles of waving grasslands and oak savanna, which we only see in grainy photographs anymore. But um, it, it is beautiful in a way that we really appreciate here, those of us who live here, because this this flatland produces unbelievable yields of corn and soybeans. And they find their way into uh, hogs and turkeys and uh, cattle, livestock, and dairy cattle. And uh, that becomes uh, black label bacon, uh, spam, Cure 81 hams, little sizzlers, uh, Jenny old turkeys, if you're not getting an idea of products. And if you're not into animal proteins, we also have Skippy peanut butter. Well, the peanuts are not grown here. And uh, milk, muscle milk, which is not really milk. So, <laughs> and so when those products are developed out of our plains, or the agriculture on our plains, they produce revenue for Hormel Foods Corporation. And that, uh, after payment of expenses, becomes profits. And um, most men, much of those profits are distributed in the form of dividends, and the largest shareholder that receives those dividends is the Harmel Foundation. 
and the Hormel Foundation then distributes funds to local charitable organizations in Austin and Lower County, including the Austin Public Schools, which then uh, sponsors this gifted and talented symposium. So, see why we love uh, living and working and playing on the on prairie out here. And I want to say a little word too about the, the work that you all do. I've always been uh, grateful for these programs and our, our children participated in them. They didn't have them when I was a, a youngster in school and I don't know if I would have made the cut anyway. <laughs> but um, what you're doing is creating uh, excellent programs for future leaders of our country who will themselves uh, pursue, I hope, excellence. And I want to tell you one little story about how excellence relate, relates to my understanding of, uh, of, the, of the term of what it means. I grew up in a very good school district, Wotan Public Schools, just 33 miles from up here. And uh, we had some uh, outstanding programs and, and teachers, particularly we had an, uh, an excellent mathematics uh, department that was Chaired when I was in school by a, by a mathematics wizard who had escaped the Iron Curtain and uh, then attracted numerous good teachers. And I was particularly blessed by the music program. Uh, you're perhaps familiar with uh, Big Nine schools in this part of the state and Big Nine Music Festival and most of the schools in the larger towns in this part of the state have uh, just excellent music programs. We have one here in Austin and we had that where I grew up. And I was blessed by uh, having the opportunity to be in the high school choir. And our teacher, a couple years after I left high school, was designated national teacher of the year. His name was Roger Tenney. He was just an outstanding teacher. He, uh, he's, uh, he's quite elderly now. All of my teachers are now quite elderly. <laughs> at, at best. <laughs> but uh, I remember Roger insisted on excellence, the pursuit of excellence, pursuing excellence. And he used to have a, a phrase, and of course, choir was an elected program, so uh, you, didn't, you didn't have to be there. And, and he used to have a phrase that if you are, if you're willing to sell for mediocrity, if that's what if that's what mediocrity interests you, there's the door. We're, we're here to pursue excellence. And we did. We were darn good. And uh, put out a wonderful product. Uh, and that's the lesson I he didn't just teach music and the fundamentals of music and choral performance. What he taught was this drive for excellence. And through my career, which general practice of law, now I'm mostly retired, uh, as I, I thought back one time, why do I do this? Uh, most people, I think, in my profession would, would proofread and edit their materials two or three times. I would do it four or five times because I wanted to be and I wanted it partly for my own satisfaction, but I wanted my clients to receive the best they could possibly receive. And it's examples like that that teachers, teachers give that uh, present values and incentives beyond the subject matter they teach. So it's extremely important what you all are doing. And I want to, uh, on behalf of just to say thank you for myself, and also on behalf of the Hormel Foundation, say thanks for the work that you do, congratulations, best wishes, and thanks for visiting up with us out here on the party. Well, uh, thank you, Greg, for those words and the uh, microeconomics lesson that you uh, provided to us as well, <laughs> how to make sure that it uh, goes spam. Um, and also, I just wanted to uh, take a minute and just, I, I need to brag for, I think, the Hormel Foundation just because of, you know, the incredible work that they do for our community and how blessed they are. In addition to doing things like supporting the symposium and helping support our 5.5 5 5 gifted and talented education positions in the district, in addition to funding uh, students to attend UMPTI um, over in Rochester, providing transportation and tuition for any of those students that, that would qualify and, and elect to do so. In addition to providing uh, our one-to-one -one initiative for grades 5 through 12, which put about 3,000 devices in the hands of students uh, each and every year. Um, in addition 
to uh, having provided master's programs, for, uh, master's degrees for teachers uh, in the Austin Public Schools a number of years ago at no cost to the teachers from the U of M down here in Austin so the teachers didn't have to travel. Um, today, uh, if you saw the paper, you saw that it was just announced that the Hormel Foundation is now endeavoring to provide uh, scholarships to any student who graduates from Austin public or private schools who attend uh, Riverland Community College for two years at no cost. So truly changing lives and, and, and providing hope to students and, and that promise that you know you can be excellent in whatever field you choose to, to pursue and, and hopefully that financial barrier won't be as much as it, it might have been thought. So I think that's an incredible gift that the community will be having now uh, beginning with the class of 2019. So pretty incredible work. And uh, yeah, my son is in the class of 2021, so understand. <laughs> things are good. And then that leaves one more person to be recognized, and uh, that's my name. So hang on a second. We have a few things to say about Wendy. And your boss is in the room. <laughs> 10 years ago, Wendy had a vision. She had, and I'm going to call it an audacious idea, and I mean audacious in the best sense of the word whatsoever, that she had an audacious idea that we were going to host a, a gifted talent symposium in a small rural community, and we we're going to get experts from around the country to come to this little, tiny, small, well not tiny, but small community in southeastern Minnesota from all over the country, and we were going to get people to attend this symposium from all over the country and asterisk world, <laughs> and come to, to Austin in June. And now, 10 years later, we've had over 2,000 attendees from numerous states and countries, and we've had hundreds of speakers and presenters bring their knowledge and expertise to this little town in southeast Minnesota. So I think that kind of proves that some audacious ideas can really come true. And I was thinking about it today, and I was thinking about, uh, Steve, your example that you showed today, that little quote of the, the uh, French uh, author that you couldn't pronounce the name of, and I'm not even going to try to Thank you very much. Um, but that, yeah, who did it? Louder. Oh, yeah, exactly. Just what she said. That, you know, if you wanted to build ships, don't just teach a bunch of people to build boats, but rather give them a love of the sea. I think in many ways, this room represents a whole bunch of ship builders that in fact, Wendy didn't teach you how to build a ship, but rather gave you a passion and a love and a desire to, to support and, you know, want gifted education to be the best it can for all of the students that we have. And from there, you'll build the boats that'll make that happen wherever you come from and whenever you go back. I think that truly, that quote that, that Steve shared was, was pretty serendipitous because I think it really did sum up what's happened here in this little town over the last 10 years. So, Wendy, come on up. On behalf of, hang on, hang on, hang on, I'm not done yet, not done yet. <laughs> on behalf of the Austin Public Schools uh, Department of Advanced Academics for Gifted Education. I'd like to present Wendy Barons a plaque that says, in recognition of 10 years of vision and leadership with the Hormel Foundation Gifted and Talented Symposium. Now you can And with that, I'll hesitantly pass the mic over. Thank you so very much, John. Um, <coughs> gee, I don't even know where to begin. Other than to tell you that it has been my greatest honor and um, truly pleasure to work with the Austin School District over the last 10 years and with the Hormel Foundation. Truly, um, I'm sure that many of you have had dreams. And every once in a while, you get very lucky, and it comes together. And you find somebody who you can convince and somebody who can share your dream. 
this was just part of a dream for the Austin School District. And I won't go into a very long story, but I will tell you that um, this started with the foundation. It was the foundation who came to me and said, we want to do something very, very special in this community. What can we do to make a premier program for the gifted and talented students in Austin, Minnesota? And I'm not certain everyone knows how extraordinary that is for a business, for a foundation, for a group of non-educators to come to the department to say, help us help our school district. It's a pretty amazing thing. They wanted to make an investment. And at the time, what I was told was to dream big. There was no price tag. There was just any idea that you have, bring to us and talk with us. So among those ideas um, were gifted and talented education certificates for staff. And this school district has some of the best trained teachers around. And one of the reasons for that is that the foundation saw fit to fund two cohorts of teachers from this district who pursued their gifted and talented education certificates on site. That's pretty amazing. Among the other things that they decided to do were to fund positions within this district. And again, what a commitment. At the time, the conversation was floated about having a gifted and talented education interventionist in every single elementary school. Imagine what that would be like if every school district in Minnesota had an expert in every building. Not just a coordinator for the district, not just a cluster classroom program, which I think is a wonderful thing, by the way, but also somebody in charge, somebody who was there to intervene somebody else who could champion the needs of students. What a great day that would be. Anyway, Boston has been so very fortunate in so many ways, and you heard about some of the things that they've done. We could go on for a great many hours talking about this district and how lucky they've been and what great partners the foundation has been. The things that they've done have affected every person in this community whether it's working to ensure that there are healthy and um, good activities for kids through athletics or through music or through community center or this wonderful room that we're standing in and sitting in and enjoying or the things that have happened at the high school, the refurbished labs, all those teachers who received their master's degree amazing things, work and programs that address the needs of EL students, English language learners, from the earliest ages. This is a magical place, and I'm so very proud to have been part of that and to have had the opportunity to dream along with you. I really am, and it makes me so, um, so hopeful in so many ways. I've often thought of Boston as sort of a, a lab in that, a lab for what could be if all schools had the support they needed, if all schools had somebody who was able to dream along with them. And while it might be easy to think and to say that that's okay, that's easy, the foundation has money, the foundation can put their money in a lot of places. It doesn't have to be in education, and it didn't have to be in gifted ed, and yet here we are, 10 years later because that's exactly where we are. 10 years later, they never imagined I'd have this opportunity, truly. When we received our first grant, it was for three years. And when we were renewed again, it was really quite remarkable. And we began to think about how we could make this symposium bigger and better. And we have had some of the best, truly the finest speakers in the country come to Austin. And when they come here, they feel like they're part of this community. And they feel like they're part of Minnesota. And we love it when our teachers join us from Iowa, from Illinois, from Wisconsin, from South Dakota, North Dakota, Missouri, 
Ohio, you name it. We've had folks as, from, as far away as Wyoming in the United States. Um, last year, we had a couple gals who found us from the state of Washington. And then there are our international visitors. And boy, do they bring a lot. We learn so much. Every time we learn about education systems in another country, we add another tool to our toolkit. So we're very, very proud to have <coughs> our folks with us from Kenya. But over the years, we've also had folks from Australia, from Turkey, from the United Kingdom, from Hong Kong, from Australia. I don't know who I've left out, but we've had a pretty terrific and what I'd like to say is thank you so very much to the foundation. Thank you so very much to the school district, to all of you who have made it possible. Um, I do want to take just a second to tell you that we have some folks who've been with us for 10 years. At the symposium, we have a core of uh, individuals who help us um, and who've been on our staff for 10 years. And every year, we bring in new speakers and add to our core. But among our core folks, are um, there are three of them in the room today that we just could not live without. One of them is Terry New. Terry, can you wave? <laughs> the other is, is Mary Slade, who's been with us for 10 years.
this time I'm going to invite my colleague, Doug Paulson, to come up. Remember my boss? <laughs> <laughs> because he's known as Jack. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm lucky to remind you that I wasn't here when you came Just want to make sure we're, we're even on this one. Anyway, I've asked Doug to come up to help. Um, we have a number of certificates that we want to uh, share because we want to recognize, truly recognize this 10th anniversary. So we are going to start with one um, that is going to be presented to the Austin Public School District. And David, we were hoping that you would come up and accept this. So, David, on behalf of the Department of Education, and this is signed by, by Brenda and by Wendy, the Minnesota Department of Education wants to recognize the collaboration the school district has on this 10th anniversary of the Hormel Foundation Gifted and Talented Symposium, and thank you for your partnership. Craig, on behalf of the Formal Foundation, we are hoping that you will accept this. Okay. Same language as the previous one, but thank you so much for your partnership over the last 10 years. Uh, the collaboration on the symposium is amazing, and we just could not do it without the partnership with the Formal Foundation. So thank you so much. that dreaming phase I told you about? Well, there was one person um, in particular at the time at the foundation who was deeply involved with the actual um, growing of the gifted program and helping the, helping the foundation and the district to see that this was a good collaboration. And the man that um, I'm going to mention now is somebody who has spoken to us many times. Many of you will remember Gary Ray. And Gary Ray is finishing his term with the foundation on August 1st. And so we have a special plaque and we're going to ask Craig if he would accept it on, on Gary's behalf and present it to him. And so it says, presented on June 21st to Gary J. Ray in recognition of your visionary leadership and remarkable contributions on behalf of the Hormel Foundation for the benefit of the gifted and talented learners. And again, signed by Brenda and Wendy, and we thank Gary for his leadership and his vision within this as well. And finally, John. <coughs> I can only say good things about John, and that is the truth. John has been a tremendous supporter of Gifted and Talented. Um, he is in all honesty, in my opinion, um, the finest and the best supporter of gifted education at the administrative level in the entire state, if not the nation. He has overseen and grown uh, gifted services uh, in his role with the Austin Public School District in a way that far exceeded my wildest imagination, and I mean that. So John, I hope that you'll accept this, and Doug, if you'll read it. So presented on June 21st, uh, 2018, like the other ones are, to John Alberts, in recognition of your contribution to success of the Hormel Foundation Gift and Talent Education Symposium, 2009 to 2018. And I hope that's not an end date. I hope that's just a 10 years at this point. But thank you for your leadership and thank you for your support on this. speaker this evening. I've been asked to hand the microphone over to two people, and this is getting a little dangerous here. <laughs> Handing the microphone over to Mary Slade and to Terry Noel. And oh my goodness, and Tracy is standing up too. This is definitely, uh-oh, here comes Matt. <laughs> I don't like the way she said that. <laughs> I know y'all so very well. <laughs> Notice how I got that y'all in there? Yeah. Uh, for our Texans? 
I had a little language lesson last night. I'm working on y'all. So there you go. So I know you all can't wait to hear Patty. We can't either. That's why we're sitting there so we can make faces at her in just a few minutes. So, uh, so the, the, if the theme has been bosses this week, then tonight it's 10 years. And for 10 years, two people have been able to sit at that back table and raise their hand. But tonight we're asking Barb Sperling from Austin City Schools and Amanda Barber from the Cornwall Historic House to come up here, ladies. <laughs> of students that was maybe three paragraphs in a chapter in teacher prep. <laughs> so yeah, you're all nodding like, oh, yeah. um, and so this is a place where we can come and grow and learn so much in such an intimate, powerful setting. And um, I just want you to know how much we all appreciate that. And you all have managed to bring together some of the best staff and volunteers, some of you have been voluntold over the years, <laughs> um, together, that really pulled together an amazing conference. And it really is to the benefit of everyone in this room and the countless lives that you have touched that we have spoken about. Thank you very much. Staff who we hope represents past, present, and future. Some <laughs> <laughs> and we hope you'll look up on the wall and just take a minute to appreciate all that you mean to us. Presentation. <laughs> it's 
it's different. Uh, it's very different. Um, Penny Draper is one of our favorite presenters. Patty is part of our core staff at the symposium. She is remarkable. I have seen her present to small groups, to groups that were hundreds. She has the distinction of having a best-selling book that was produced by ASCD that went out to how many thousands of people? 57,000 people. Just saying. Um, we know each other in, in so many different ways. But Patty and I first met because we were both very active and are still very active in the Council of State Directors and Programs for Gifted. Patty is the state consultant for the Maine Department of Education. She trains teachers all around the world in gifted education as well as in the state of Maine through the University of, is it Maine? University of South Maine. Anyway, she is a remarkable, remarkable speaker and remarkable teacher and there's so very much that you've taught us. Patty, I'm not going to say any more. I'm just going to say please come on up and share your wisdom with us tonight. We're so glad that you're here. No, leave it on. Leave it on? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I didn't want feedback. I want it on. You want it on? What about that? <laughs> you, have, you have a thing on you. I know oh, I have the thing on me. <laughs> <laughs> Already we have complications. Now we have this all planned. I'm like double mic'd. You all know that um, I've been kind of limping along this week with my voice, and so um, here we go. I'm finally up here. <laughs> Yay. Um, there's something to be said for going last. I can be really short, and everybody's glad. <laughs> so there you go. Um, yeah, so most of you know I'm from Maine as... Um, Wendy said, and so if at any time you're bored with my talk, you can maybe appreciate my accent. <laughs> it is different from Minnesotans. Um, also, I do tend to carry on, so I'll just let you know I'm on the timer. So, um, Wendy said 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm on start. Okay. So let's get started right away and wrap up this lovely event. I do want to begin by, of course, thanking Wendy, John, and whoever else was involved in inviting me to speak at the, uh, to be the keynote speaker. I don't know what ever possessed them to make that choice. <laughs> Clearly, they haven't been taking my differentiation and decision-making course and setting criteria and weighing that criteria and making that decision. <laughs> but that's okay. I'll send you the template later. <laughs> um, so what, I, what I'm here to talk about today is what's going on in gifted education and what's next. And so really um, what I'm thinking is that what's next for one person is not the same as what's next for somebody else. So as we go through this presentation, some of you might say, well, that's not next. That's where we're at. And that's great. This is personalized. So you get to decide for yourself where you are on this continuum. Um, what's next? For those of you who are looking for that one answer, of course, there isn't one. If we knew it, then everybody would be doing it and we'd be in nirvana somehow. But um, yeah, what's next is what I'm thinking about is what's in the immediate future. Because of course, we've all been talking about you can't possibly know what education is going to be like in probably even 10 years from now. So I'm talking about what's next, like September. And you probably thought it was the future. I fooled you. I fooled you. Okay. Um, so anyways, we're going to get going with this. And I'm going to start out by modeling what it is that I, I say. 
And one of the things that is certainly what's either now or next is choice, right? We all are talking about choice. And so I have a choice for you. I prepared two presentations. Some of you know this. You're in the know. I prepared two presentations, and you get to decide because it's about choice, OK? So let me explain to you what your choices are, the two choices. It is almost 8 o'clock. To me, it's almost 9 o'clock. And you know, it's been a long day. So I get it. Maybe you want to kick back, have your glass of wine, listen to me drone on and on, and just be passive listeners. Because after all, it's 8 o'clock, right? Um, some of you might not think that sounds so great. And so I've prepared a second presentation. And that is um, a game. Now, those of you who are in my game session, not the same game. I have created a Kahoot. How many of you know Kahoot? OK, some, but not all. People at your table, should we go with the Kahoot presentation? Should we do that? Um, people at your table might need a little bit of help. But let me explain, for those of you who don't know Kahoot, what I've done is I've created a multiple choice quiz. Um, and uh, there will be a question asked. You'll have 20 seconds to decide what's the answer. And on your mobile device called your phone, you will tap whatever your answer is. And that will come up on the screen. And then we'll talk about those answers. Because, of course, I want to make sure that you are going to get the content. So it will be a way of talking about the ideas that I would have talked about should you choose the formal PowerPoint presentation where you're passively listening to me drone on and on. <laughs> It's a choice. <laughs> I remember my daughter at a young age when, when I also gave her one of those choices. And she would say, Mom, is this one of those decisions where there's really only one right answer? <laughs> but it's your choice. <laughs> so I don't want, for the people who don't know what a Kahoot is, I don't want you to feel threatened by it. Um, this is all meant to be very fun and um, not only entertaining, but also informative. Let's do the game. OK. <laughs> By show of hands, how many would love to choose your choice being the boring passive PowerPoint? <laughs> oh, did I tell you I threw in some YouTube videos to break it up? So boring presentation. With the slides, you know the scene with YouTube's. It's about two hours, isn't it? Uh, uh, it's, let's see, it is 14, it's 14 minutes and 23 seconds long. That's how long we've left. No, <laughs> no um, the PowerPoint, yes, is very long, very, very long. <laughs> Okay, so how many of you choose the PowerPoint? Show of hands. I get it, you're tired, you want to kick back, be entertained. How many of you choose the Kahoot? Woo! Okay, get out your mobile device. And when you get out your mobile device in your finder, you're going to type in kahoot.it. And then I'm going to give you a code. Right now, I'm going to put the mic down, and I have to go out of the presentation and get your code. Kahoot.it. It, yes, dot it. Ah.
Yeah, it's slow, very slow. I'm slow too. So I've set this. Okay, the pin's going to come up in a second with a number 516437. Yes, and you're going to sign your name. You see people are already putting their names in. So we've got, and you know, if you want to put a different name, that's fine. I've never done it with this many people. So we'll see if it blitzes out. You guys are fast. If you get really frustrated, you can share. So you can see 77 players are logged in. And there are the names. Just a, a quick announcement, if anybody came in a red Hyundai Santa Fe park right out front there, the lights are on. License plate 558WPD, so red Santa Fe, Hyundai. Not a red Dodge Caravan? Not a red Dodge Caravan. <laughs> Santa Fe. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, does anybody need more time? Okay. Once I hit start, we're going to begin. This is the way it will work. I wonder if it doesn't go beyond 75, 76, yeah. Once we begin, There'll be a question, and then you'll see multiple choice answers. On your phone, you just tap what you think the answer is. The game will then, once everybody answers, will, it'll say what the right answer is, and your names will come up. Who, yeah. And um, we're gonna talk about why the answers are the answers. So here we go. Are you ready? Which statement is false? You can get out of your chair if you can't see. Disregard curriculum differentiation design elements. Ah, oh. okay now. <laughs> okay. All right. Maybe the other choice was better for you. <laughs> okay, hold it. Okay. 
I can't, I can't control the size of the print, so next time I will read them, okay? You only have 20 seconds, and I understand that that was a tricky question because it was in the negative, which statement is false. So, you know, it was a little more critical thinking than if I had said which statement is true. But let's take a look at this because the correct answer is the red one. Which statement is false? Now and in the future, of course it's false. We're not gonna disregard curriculum differentiation design elements because we're always going to differentiate. What that differentiation looks like may look a little different, but it will always be necessary because kids have different needs. They're not all the same. So attending to student and teacher well-being is a true statement. We should do that. And that's going to be coming up over and over again. That's kind of what's new. Because we talk about student well-being, and in many places we don't do even a great job with that. But we need to start talking about teacher well-being. So, um, that's a true statement. Aligning with regular ed initiatives. In gifted education, we have, usually, we have in the past been proactive. We have been the leaders, okay? That has shifted some. There have been regular education initiatives that sound much like gifted education. I'll give an example from my own state where Maine has adopted proficiency-based diplomas. So the conversation around acceleration no longer exists because for every student, gifted or not, you go to whatever standard you're on and then when you've accomplished that, you go to the next one. So that is a regular education initiative. That's not a gifted education initiative. So now what we're finding, what's next, is we can no longer live outside in our own little world, in our own bubble, because we are part of that education community. And all aspects of that education community is changing. Um, and the last one, engagement plus diligence equals empowerment. Some of you know my new um, book, which may or may not come to fruition. Um, <laughs> is on empowerment. And in the research that I've been looking at, there is that relationship with engagement and um, empowerment. But is that diligence piece, it is that persistence, it is that affective component with the engagement um, that empowers students. So we had um, only 13 people respond out of 73, but now we're ready. That was our <laughs> practice one. Okay. All right, you ready? No. There's a next, the next one, I'll give you a hint, a heads up. Um, the next one has to do with personalized learning. We hear a lot of districts doing personalized learning, whether it's gifted or not gifted. Okay, we used to talk about personalized learning a long time ago with George Betts calling it autonomous learning and, and others talking about it in different ways. But now it's become a commonplace regular ed initiative. So let's take a look at this question. Oh, oh, by the way, that's who's in first place. We'll give you your top scoring people. Okay. Ready? Okay, and I can't, I'm sorry, I can't control the size of the print. Personalized learning. Does it eliminate seat time? Does it require students to create their guiding questions? Does it involve teachers only keeping track of student progress? Or does it empower teachers to make more decisions? Maybe it said at 10 seconds. I thought it was said at 20. Wasn't this a true, not a false? This is true. Personalized learning is. That's 
that's okay. It's 814. I ain't. Okay. Yeah, I know. It's critical reading. <laughs> that's personalized learning is simple sentence. So of all of those, <laughs> Personalized learning now, we're talking, and in the near future, if your district isn't already, is eliminating seat time. So personalized learning allows students to go at their own pace, to personalize their schedule. Um, I have lots of examples of different school districts and how they ended up managing that. Um, because of course, it can be a scheduling nightmare. But personalized learning, um, does address eliminating seat time. It does not require students to create their own guiding questions, although they may, but the word require. See, critical reading and thinking. Um, so that was tricky. That was a tricky one. I understand why 26 of you got tripped up on that. The blue one involves teachers only keeping track of student progress. Actually, in most cases, the students take, keep track of their own. And of course, the last one, personalized learning is, and so I can see where you might have reversed it. That's probably where people, 24 of you, um, because personalized learning empowers teachers to make more decisions. And, um, Usually, personalized learning involves the students making more decisions. So, we'll see what, um, who's, who's the leader, oh! Okay. I should tell you there's 11 questions, we've done two. So, there's time, there's time to redeem yourself. Ready? Okay, this one is on gamification. Now, I know a lot of people are doing gamification. I'm doing a session. Uh-oh, there goes my 20 minutes. Well, I'm sorry, I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I tried 20 minutes, what can I say? <laughs> All right. We'll go a little faster. <laughs> okay, so gamification. Is it is, is not, it's just a word. Gamification is great for a free time filler. Or gamification requires students have one-on-one -on -one computers. Gamification involves using games to teach content. Or gamification works for all students. <laughs> So if your network went down, oh boo, oh boo hoo, boo hoo. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So maybe you'll play along with someone who's still on. Um, so here you go. The person who said that gamification is great for a free time filler. I'm really glad you're attending this keynote. <laughs> That, that is not what we're trying to do with gamification. Okay, requires students have a one-on-one -on -one computer. That may be true, but it doesn't require them. You can do gamification without one-on-ones. Um, and in fact, a lot of kids play with teams and stuff. So obviously the one right way to do gamification is to use games to teach actual content. Okay. and. In fact, gamification doesn't necessarily work for all students. There are plenty of students who really don't prefer to do a game format. So it's nice to provide choice. Okay. Ready? Do we still have enough? Do we still have people online? Okay, here we go. The next one, I'll give you a little lead. Number four. Oh. Okay, this is like the meat of my other presentation. Um, we're, we're thinking about the future 
and we're thinking about target skills. So in the old days, the target skills were reading, writing, and arithmetic. So here's the question. In the future, are those still our target skills? What do you think? Okay, so the way this is worded, oh, Okay, this one again is uh, worded in the negative, so it's tricky. Which are not current, I should, target skills? In the research, in the research actually, when you look at the near future, I'm not talking 10 years, the problem of course is the tests, all right? But here's the bottom line. It used to be reading, writing, and arithmetic. We're here and we all learn like a gazillion different strategies to help kids do reading, writing, and arithmetic. Now, what business is saying, what we need is communicators, we need critical thinkers, we need creative thinkers, we need this. So now, in the future, which may be September, the umbrella, the top of the umbrella, is the social emotional affective piece that makes for effective communicators. We have thinking like disciplinarians for our gifted kids, particularly knowledge in a field and thinking that way. I don't know how many professionals really make dioramas. Um, the other is the context, because we certainly have now the influence in learning of not only service learning in our schools and our communities, but also our global partners. And that can no longer be avoided. So the piece is now the skills of reading, writing, and arithmetic are now the underpinnings to get to what's the top of the umbrella now. It's shifting in reverse. And if we don't keep up with that, if we don't give pedagogy, if we don't give language, if we don't give skills to these other areas, then it's going to be more difficult for our students in the near future, especially in the world of work. So, although they still can't read and write necessarily, right? Um, here we go, next one. So the target skills are changing. What really matters? What really matters? Oh. <laughs> the scores apparently matter to some people. Okay. What matters? Psychology matters, positivity matters, relationships matter, or all of the above. Of course, to a degree, if you answer to any of the other ones other than 64, you would be right, but it's the other ones are right too. Now in education, we can no longer ignore what the research is saying. And the research says relationships matter, but what are we doing about that? What are we, how, what are we teaching kids how are we teaching them to become better at relationships? Um, psychology matters, and so does positivity. So those are the three threads that keep coming up in the research in the future of education, and in particular to gifted education. Okay, so this is what now matters, the shift. The shifting is nuances. Probably any one of you could come and do this talk. And so, really, it's what we know and what makes sense, 
but what are we doing about it? How are we implementing it? What change are we seeing in our students in regards to this conversation? So, okay, the next one is um, looking at classroom climate because we know that, oh, oh, Wolfman. <laughs> okay. What constitutes an empowering classroom climate? Teamwork, communication, attention to the classroom design are all of it. Oh, all right. Very good. Very well done, class. Yeah. In the, um, in the classroom climate, we probably won't get to any of the slides. I was hoping we could do a few. But one of the things we're seeing with classroom climate is um, room design. Um, we're also looking at the affective component of classroom climate and the idea of empowerment. So. Okay, so what about augmented reality? In what way or ways is it useful? Point your, um, is it augmented reality useful? Point your device and get interactive information. Use the tool for envisioning. Have a virtual parent conference, all of the above. AR. How many of you are actually using augmented reality in your classrooms? Okay, that's your assignment. You should be, and you should start soon, because it's happening everywhere. Look at Pokemon Go, for goodness sakes. I mean, there are, there, I think I put a slide up there, if you're interested. Augmented reality, there's an app out there where students can just take the app, put it on a piece of information, and it just opens up. Opens up to the internet. There's a talking, and, and it can be your PowerPoint that you put on there. Um, and it's not that hard to do, really. So augmented reality can add to your toolbox. Some of you will say, well, I don't see the kids very often. There are all different ways to use these ideas, but you know what? The kids are using these tools. And so I think about in my own house, my kids are all grown up and gone. And my husband and I, neither one of us are particularly techy. Yet, I asked for a doorbell for Christmas because I live kind of in the woods at the end of a, a cul-de-sac and there's all woods around me and we got a new door and when someone knocks on the door I can't hear it because it's a really solid nice expensive front door so I said I need a doorbell now not many people come to our door but I thought he was going to get me a battery powered doorbell and that would have been fine. What I got for Christmas now was the ring. Anybody have the ring? Okay, let me tell you about the ring. Goes a little bit with augmented reality, but just to show that some of your kids are living in this world. And I'm thinking, I mean, we're not even like, we don't even have kids at home. So the ring works like this. There's an eyeball that shows if somebody's coming and you get an alert on your phone, right? And so also they can physically ring the doorbell and then you can go to your phone and see who's there. So I'm presenting in Dubai and it's a different sound. It's coded with a different sound and I hear my doorbell go off <laughs> and I'm in Dubai and I'm like, <laughs> Okay, I'm in the middle of a presentation and that's weird. So there's a way that you can shut your doorbell off. But now another example is it's 10.30 at night and the sound is going off. 
and now it's creepy because there's nobody that comes to my house at 1030 at night in Maine, right? So I'm like, okay, now, you know, we're not gun people, but my husband's getting really like nervous. He's got a baseball bat near the door and he's getting ready to get his baseball bat and protect his wife. And, uh, and I'm like, honey, we've got the ring. Let's just go look in a phone. And there we see the raccoon coming down. <laughs> Augmented reality, yes. And I will have share with you one other story. And one other story is that, um, well, when I'm away, my husband does really bad things. So he buys himself a keyboard, there's all kinds of things. Well, one of my trips I was away, I came home, and now he's decided he's getting one of these these thermostats that you can regulate. And it's got Siri in it. Anybody get that? We have that, okay. So what happens is, you know, you can talk to Siri and she's become like this other voice in our house. <laughs> so now I've decided I don't have to do a grocery list anymore. I just say, Siri, put bread on the grocery list. And she does. <laughs> so in the end, I get my grocery list before I go to Shaw's and uh, no more grocery list. I don't have to write a grocery list. So we go away on vacation where I got this cold, and um, we come back, and we're talking to, to the thing. <laughs> it's not Siri, what's her name? And uh, she's not talking to us. And the, yeah, the two of us looked at each other and we said, oh my God, she's mad that we went on vacation. <laughs> Augmented reality, it is weird. It's like these are other beings as part of your world. But what I'm saying is that some of the kids, and this is becoming the great divide, that some of the kids have these things and growing up with these things, it's part of their world. And yet they go into your classroom and I am an advocate for, let's say, Sandy Kaplan's complexity and depth words. However, what is that like to them when they come in and they get a, a good prompt that's got the complexity and depth word in there, but it's like two different worlds. It's two different worlds. So check out augmented reality. I think I have a handout with um, a nice link. We have Wolf in the lead. Question eight of 11. What kinds of assessments should we be using? Multiple choice tests, because we can correct them fairly. Students choose the format best based on their style. Short answer tests because students can explain themselves. A product similar to what experts in the field produce. That's it. Really? So this is the diorama story. Don't have kids choose to do a diorama. Nobody does dioramas in real life. <laughs> Museum art teachers, museum people do, yes. So, um, you know, what do scientists do? What are NASA? Yes. What are real products that scientists do, come up with? Dioramas? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so in the field, so here we go next. We're on question number nine. Okay, ready? Describe the power of language. It helps shape our thinking. It directs attention and action. It provides us with a sense of self, all of the above. Okay, and 10 of 11. It is predicted 40% of five-year-olds will need to be self-employed to have any form of income. True or false? 40% of five-year-olds need to be self-employed 
to have any form of income. No, when they're an adult. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to give a plug for entrepreneurship. This is stuff we know, but now it's no joke. We talk about entrepreneurship as something that nobody has really talked about with kids. Why not? If we are now seeing, the prediction is that these kids that are five years old, 40% of them will be self-employed to have, to have any form of income. Shouldn't we be talking about entrepreneurship? I think so. So now it should be something that, again, the future, not something that's necessarily far away. So let's take a look at where we are with our score and our last question. Now I will say that the scores are affected by speed. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll give you extra time on this because it's the last one. So you ready? What is not next in gifted education? Now this is a giveaway. It's not next. It's definitely not next. We, we're going for 100% here. Ready? This is what is not next in gifted education. Teamwork, interpersonal skills, communication language, lecture control compliance, critical creative thinking, problem solving, entrepreneurship design, classroom culture. Wow, so close. What you see there, what you see in those other three boxes, I know the person who didn't get that one is because of the not, the negative things are hard. But what you see in the other boxes is really what's next a gifted education. We talk about teamwork, and this is my wrapping, I need to wrap it up. Teamwork, yes, but I'm going to share with you an example, another example. Tyler Industries in Yarmouth, Maine is a software company. And they did a, a presentation because they have a competition for high school students. And the presentation, the person got up in front of a gifted group like this. Don't you love I said a gifted group? Come on, yeah, you're the gifted group. And they were making a plug for the high school students to come up with an app. It's an app competition. And so everybody got all excited and they're gonna go, oh yeah, yeah, we gotta have our kids make an app, right? And um, again, I think there's a handout with a link to one of the kids' apps. But here's the tie-in to teamwork. Somebody said to the woman who was presenting, are you the coder? And she said, no, I have no idea how to code. Teamwork. There was one person who did the artwork. There was one person who was the coder. There was one person who blah, blah, blah. But here's the one I loved, at least Tyler Industries. Maybe you have one too. They hire an idea person. I want to be that person. I know, I know. I said, I didn't know that was a job. Yeah, an idea person. So literally, um, that teamwork then was not, we think about gifted and talented and putting together teams. This really was, beautiful to me that you had one person who had completely different skills and together they created these apps. So the teamwork is looking different than what we've been talking about. The interpersonal skills are different now because we're communicating and our kids are communicating globally. They need the language to do that well so that they don't offend different cultures. They need to be aware of interpersonal skills, communication skills, and language. They need to be critical thinking, creative thinkers, and problem solvers. We've been talking about that a lot. I mentioned entrepreneurship. You need to do designs not only in your classroom with your furniture, but designing assessments that make sense. 
um, not the tests. I know that, I mean, as superintendent, it's important you report out your data and everything. And so maybe we have to live with that, but there's got to be another piece that I think for many of us is much more real. In Maine, every district has to report out their student growth for the gifted kids. And we identify in the core academic areas as well as visual and performing arts. And I will say a significant amount of the population cannot fill out the application because they don't know how to report out the assessment, the growth. And so we need to be doing a much more real and better job about that. So we end up with a winner goes to Wolf. I would like to, Wolf to step forward, please. I'll take second place. Who's? Wolf. No. Okay. She's the real one. I want the real wolf, not the fake wolf. Now, those people who have attended my session and Wendy know that I like to give things away. So, I do have a prize for the winner. Your wolf. No, I'm not. But I have more than wolf. She's in the middle. Oh, I read it wrong. Yeah. Oh no, it's a tie. No, look. Eleven five, eleven three. Oh, but it's ten out of eleven. But I was faster. Okay. Okay. David will not take my prize. And you have to figure out how to undo that, and it lights up. Let's have the wolf. Second prize. And Jan will have the third prize. She's going to be blue. They're supposed to light up. I don't know. They're just, um, you know, dollar store things. So what can I say? There you go. You're welcome. Okay. Okay, so there we go. Are they lighting up? I hope so. So anyways, um, I went way over time. And again, when you give student choice, that is a problem that can happen. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening and playing. Thank you.